Hello everyone and uh, welcome back. This is Miguel Fonso Mendez from the Von Karman Institute and this is the second video in the series of tutorial on model analysis using uh, our software package Modulo developed together with David Nini. Um, as you see in the comments below, the series is composed of eight videos. The first three are dedicated to theory and the last five uh, that will be given by David Nini are dedicated to hands-on session using our open source software. So in the first video I gave you a general overview of model analysis and its mathematical framework and I have introduced the notation that we will use in the whole series. In this video we will focus on how two classical decomposition fit in this framework. In particular um, I will talk about the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT, and the proper orthogonal decomposition. I will close with some exercises for you to see this decomposition in action. These uh, exercises are already available both in Python and MATLAB in our GitHub repository, so you can already start playing with them. Uh, and we will then later do this one using our software, which has its own graphical user interface. So I will start from the from the DFT. The first important point is that the DFT is not a data-driven decomposition because its basis is not tailored to the dataset at hand. On the contrary, the DFT basis is constructed a priori from the sampling frequency of the data. So let me first consider the case of the DFT of a 1D signal, which is a vector denoted as D. In the DFT, the basis is the set of complex harmonics and every entry of the DFT results from the inner product of the data with the corresponding basis element. The element in the basis differ in the frequency of the harmonics so that every entry in the DFT is the inner product or correlation of the data with an harmonic uh, that has a certain frequency. I here use Psi Fn to denote the generic uh, end basis vector of the Fourier basis and this is of course the inner product notation that we have introduced in the first video. Now to better understand the DFT architecture let us see how frequency and time discretizations are linked. Here I'm using N for the index in the frequency domain and delta F for the frequency resolution or frequency bin as they say in signal processing and I use K for the index in the time domain and delta T for the time resolution. Note that in this case I'm using a, a Python indexing, so that is to say I start counting from 0 and not from 1. NF is the number of frequency bins and NT is the number of mesh points in the time domain. And these are not necessarily equal. After introducing this uh, discretization here, there's a key observation. The range of frequencies is in fact defined by the sampling frequency. According to Nyquist's Shannon sampling theorem, the frequency axis can only go from minus fs over 2 to fs over 2, where fs is the sampling frequency. Now, you should notice that the sampling frequency is also linked to the time discretization. Delta t is just 1 over fs, of course. And therefore, we see that the Fourier matrix is actually constructed using exponential of this form, where we have basically lost the, the connection with the time domain. Basically, it's, it's all about taking powers of complex numbers that have uh, a, a unitary modulus. Now, if we go back to the matrix formalism that was introduced in the first video, we can see how to construct our uh, basis matrix. We will proceed as usual uh, uh, as follows by putting in every column of our basis matrix the element of the basis. So in this case we will have nf columns because we have nf frequencies. And each basis element is a vector of column of length nt because it must span the entire uh, discrete time domain. And every column basically is obtained by taking powers of uh, complex numbers that are equally spaced along the unitary circle. Here I'm showing you an example with 16 frequencies. The angle associated to each element of uh, the basis is called digital frequency. And from the Nyquist Shannon theorem, we know that this has to be within one round of the circle. The digital frequency can go from 0 to 2 pi or from uh, minus pi to pi. And this just depends on how you assembly your matrix. 
Usually it is assembled from 0 to 2 pi, but as engineers we like more the symmetric plot of the Fourier transform of the real signal, so we usually shift it back uh, afterwards, after the decomposition is done, to minus pi to pi. In MATLAB or in Python, this is done using a, a single common called ft shift. Note that uh, here I use the subscript f to distinguish the DFT from the other decomposition that we will see in this video and in the next one. With this notation, the Fourier transform is written as usual, as we've seen in the first video, as a basis matrix dag times the vector to be transformed. Observe that the number of basis element and f here can be even much larger than nt at this step. That is what uh, happens if you want to increase the frequency resolution. In principle, nf could even be infinite, even if nt is finite. And this is the limit at which we have the discrete time Fourier transform, or DTFT, which is a transform that is discrete in time but continuous in the frequency domain. In practice, having a rectangular basis matrix has some uh, major limitation when it comes to inverting the transform, because uh, the inversion of a rectangular matrix is not unique, and in the Fourier uh, transform this generates what is known as uh, aliasing in the time domain. If we are interested in going back and forth uh, easily, it is a good idea to take nf equal to nt. Then this basis matrix becomes a square, and uh, it becomes in particular the famous Fourier matrix. This matrix has two key properties, first is symmetric, so transposition has no effect, and second is orthonormal, so all the columns of this matrix uh, are orthogonal and have unitary length. And this means that the inverse is actually equal to the uh, dagged but since transposition is no effect, then the inverse is just the conjugation of this matrix. The famous uh, uh, FFT algorithm that you find in MATLAB or in Python or in many other programming languages, the fast Fourier transform, is nothing more than a very clever algorithm to perform multiplication of uh, a vector with this matrix in a, in a very efficient way. So in this uh, case, the transform and the inverse are very fast to compute and have no problem of uh, uniqueness. Now, uh, the DFT in the formalism of uh, modern analysis that we have introduced in the previous video is constructed by performing the DFT in every spatial point. We have seen in the previous video that we want to decompose a dataset that is constructed by putting every time realization, that is every snapshot, in the column of a matrix. Every column contains the data at a certain time and every row has a temporal evolution of the data at a certain location. In this case we want to do the DFT in the time domain, so we need to proceed by row. The DFT of a matrix proceeding row-wise can be computed by right multiplication with the conjugate of the Fourier matrix, and the inverse is then right multiplication by the Fourier matrix. So the row-wise Fourier transform of our data can be written uh, as shown here. To see how d hat looks like, consider that if every row of the matrix d has the temporal evolution of the data at that specific location, then every row of d hat has the corresponding frequency content or Fourier transform of the data at that specific location. So, in a way, d hat also contains information on how a certain frequency is spatially distributed, so it contains information about our spatial structures. However, to get back to our uh, um, classical factorization for modern analysis, we want every uh, spatial structure to have unitary length, and this can be simply obtained by normalizing the results of, uh, of d hat. So that finally we will have spatial structures, amplitudes uh, uh, along the diagonal of a matrix in the middle, and the temporal structures that will be, in our case, simply the Fourier, uh, the Fourier modes. The algorithm therefore will uh, consist of three steps. First, you would uh, prepare the Fourier matrix. This could be done, for example, by taking the FFT of the identity matrix. 
Then uh, we will project the data set into this temporal evolution to obtain spatial uh, structures that are not yet normalized. And then the last step will be the normalization. So every element in the diagonal of the amplitude matrix is just the norm of, uh, of, uh, of each of the column of, of the d hat matrix. So let's say that the third mode tells how much the third frequency in the in the, the Fourier basis is distributed, how it is distributed in the space domain. Observe that uh, if the algorithm is, uh, is closed in, in this way, um, the modes are not ordered in terms of, uh, of amplitude. One uh, could add this possibility, our software lets you choose if you want to have the modes in a sorted order or not. And then observe that the spatial structures are, are of course complex structures. So um, they will have a real and imaginary part that has to be such that when multiplied with the corresponding temporal structure, the result is real number. Because the amplitude is a real number and the matrix that we are decomposing is also a real matrix. So we can now move to the proper tonal decomposition, the POD. The POD is a data-driven decomposition because its basis is tailored to the dataset and is designed, in fact, to provide optimal approximations. Now, to see how the POD temporal structures are computed, we first need to see how to compute approximation of the data using the temporal structures. Now, uh, given our general factorization, the first step is to move uh, on the, on the left-hand side both the temporal structures and the amplitude so that we retrieve our spatial structure as a function of, of all the other terms of the factorization. And then if we plug back these uh, spatial um, structures into our original decomposition, we arrive to an equation of this form where we have d is equal to d psi psi transpose. If Psi is complete, it's a complete orthonormal basis, that is, is of sides nt times nt, then Psi Psi transpose is identity, and so we basically get d equal to d. However, if we choose uh, an approximation, so if we take only the first r columns of uh, Psi, so Psi is not a complete basis, then Psi Psi transpose is a projection matrix, it's not identity anymore, and what we obtain here is an approximation of rank uh, r, of our original matrix. Now, this is true for any decomposition that has orthonormal temporal basis. Well, this is true also for Fourier, for example. Um, but in the case of the POD, we look for the optimal temporal basis, the one that uh, minimizes the error that we make when we replace D by this D hat. So this optimization problem can be formulated in two, in two ways, and uh, here I propose you both. Um, in particular, it is done going uh, step by step, so let's say looking at mode by mode. If you look, for example, at the first mode, we can formulate the problem in two ways. In the first way, we simply look for the d, ha d uh, tilde such that d minus d tilde, the norm of this difference is the minimum. And we can write, as I said, d tilde using this formula, but just using the first mode, and we get a structure, uh, I mean, an equation like this one. Another possibility is to hinge on the fact that this quantity is uh, never uh, negative. So basically, this is equivalent to ask for uh, this basis that has the largest uh, variance, I mean, that has the, the, the largest associated amplitude. So this is equivalent to say that we want that d c1 in this case because we are considering only the first mode is equal to the largest possible uh, quantity now both um, formulation both optimization problem have to be solved under the assumption that the temporal structure that we are using as a as a unitary unitary length so if uh, if we proceed then with any of the two let's say in this slide i will go for the variance max maximization or energy maximization if you want um, we can use any technique for constraint optimization, such as, for example, the Grandin multiplier. And here, the idea is to define a, a, an auxiliary function that has to be, uh, in this case, maximized, and that also includes the constraint. This quantity, in theory, is zero, uh, times the scalar, which is our Lagrangian multiplier in this case. Now, to solve this uh, optimization problem, we just have to differentiate this quantity with respect to our independent variable, which is in our case our temporal structure that we are that we are looking for. 
and we arrive at the conclusion that uh, this is true when uh, when this equation is true when basically uh, we we take uh, our our temporal structure we multiply it by by a matrix which is d dag d and what we get back is the very same uh, temporal structure but multiplied by a number so this is just an, an, an eigenvalue problem so what we get out of this optimization process is that uh, our temporal structures have to be eigenvectors of this very special matrix which uh, we call temporal uh, correlation matrix because you can see that uh, it contains uh, along each entry the correlation or the inner products of one snapshot with, uh, with, with another. If we now continue this uh, optimization also for approximation of rank 2, 3, 4, etc. Uh, so to obtain uh, the second, third and fourth um, temporal structures, we will see that all these structures must uh, be eigenvectors of this uh, temporal correlation matrix. But at the same time, they also need to be orthonormal. So another question is to ask, uh, to, to, to double check that uh, the matrix K can indeed have orthonormal um, eigenvectors. And this is beautifully uh, true by construction because the matrix K is uh, symmetric due to the fact that the inner product here is uh, it's a commutative uh, it's a commutative operation so DE dug the DJ is the same as DJ dug with DE and because of the symmetry then we can write down our um, eigenvalue decomposition of K as follow using uh, here uh, transposition instead of, uh, of an inversion so here we have uh, along uh, the column of the matrix psi p the temporal structures of the p of the of the pod uh, and here we have eigenvalues of uh, that corresponds that are associated to each of these and these are eigenvalues of of the of the matrix k uh, for the case of the pod now it becomes particularly interesting to see what is the consequences of of choosing this particular temporal structure to see this, imagine now we take back our general uh, matrix factorization uh, and we plug this into the definition of, uh, of K. So that this D transpose D in our case because, because D is a real, uh, real matrix. So if we introduce this factorization here and we take the transposition, we arrive uh, after some little algebra to this expression. And you should now compare this expression with the one above because we are basically writing the same thing in two different ways. And uh, you can see that these are uh, basically the same expression except for these terms in the middle. And we know that this term in the middle uh, is diagonal because that is the matrix of, uh, of uh, eigenvalues of K. And for this to be diagonal, then the only possibility is that uh, also Psi P transpose times Psi P is identity, uh, which is equivalent to say that in the case uh, of the POD, so in the case where we have chosen this specific temporal structures, then also the spatial structures are going to be orthonormal. And this is something that you can have only in the, in the POD. Now, if, if this is true, then we also see that the amplitudes of the of the of the POD modes uh, are the square root of the eigenvalues that comes out of this uh, eigenvalue decomposition of K. Now, I will propose you to do also the same exercise in the on, on the other way. So, by imposing certain kind of spatial structures and looking for when do you get the optimality, and uh, the the beauty of this of the symmetry of the POD is that you will arrive at the result that then you need uh, uh, these uh, uh, spatial structures to be eigenvectors of another correlation matrix, which is done on the other hand in the other domain. So. This would be the spatial correlation matrix, which is written as D times D transpose. And everything else will then be the same, except that you will now go from the space domain and, 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 and project back towards the time domain. Um, the other important point of the, of the POD 
is that the amplitude uh, can be computed directly at the diagonalization step so when we compute the eigenvalue decomposition of either k of or c so contrary to what we had to do in the case of Fourier here we don't need to normalize because we already have the amplitudes and as skipping this normalization step usually uh, resolve, results in, skip in, in avoiding quite some computational cost now, some of you might have uh, already recognized that the matrix factorization form of the POD that I have introduced uh, so far is just the uh, singular value decomposition, the SVD of the data matrix T. That is, uh, it's true, it's, a, it's an excellent observation that uh, also means that we can extend all the properties that we know about the SVD to our POD. The main one of which is uh, probably the uh, the optimality, which in the case of the SVD is, uh, is guaranteed by the eckhart yang minsky theorem, which uh, states two things. The first thing is what we have already shown um, up to now, and is that if we want to approximate the matrix D with, a, with a, an approximation of rank R, the best thing we can do is to choose uh, the first R uh, POD modes or uh, the first R columns of, of U, S, of U and V and the first R entries in the diagonal of S in the case of the SVD. And the second thing that uh, is important to observe is that uh, according to this theorem we also have a very uh, fast and easy way to to compute the convergence of, of our decomposition because the error that we make if we truncate the summation uh, up to rank R is exactly equal uh, if you use the L2 norm to the amplitude of the first POD mode that we have left out from the summation. This is only true for the POD and for no other decomposition. Now a note of warning before moving to the next point uh, and is that uh, in our lecture we ended up with the POD being uh, exactly equal to the SVD only because we have used uh, Cartesian meshes in space and time and this is what let us use the Eulerian inner product in which uh, every entry of the vectors uh, on which we are operating the, the inner product I have an equal weight on the other hand if we have uh, non-uniform meshes uh, this is no longer possible and we should use instead weighted inner products and in this case the link between the POD and SVD becomes uh, a bit more complicated. Finally observe that the POD concept uh, is actually more general than the, than the SVD which is uh, only let's say a matrix factorization. The POD can be used also in continuous domain and in partial differential equations. I will close now this uh, brief introduction to the POD by showing you three equivalent algorithms to compute it. The first one is known as the Sirovich method and uh, this is what I have discussed so far and what is implemented by default uh, right now in the current version of our open source software. Here we first compute uh, K, temporal correlation matrix, then we diagonalize it to compute both the temporal structures and the eigenvalues of K, from which we can get the amplitudes of the POD, and finally we project our data to obtain the spatial structure. The other possibility is to go from the space domain. In this case we will compute first C, that is the spatial correlation matrix, we will diagonalize it to get the spatial structures and the uh, eigenvalues of C from which we can compute the amplitude of the POD modes and finally project the data to get the temporal uh, structures. Now the first option is uh, the best one you can have if you have many more points in space than in time and this is what happens 99% of the time in CFD simulations for example but also I would say in many particle image velocimetry datasets. On the other hand, uh, the other method, the one uh, based on space from Lamley, uh, is a good choice if you have more points in time than in space. It's important for you to realize that these are absolutely equivalent. The third uh, method and probably the, the laziest one 
uh, is to give the to assembly the data matrix D and then give it as it is directly to an SVD uh, routine and then uh, you will assign the result uh, as shown here in the slides in terms of spatial structure and temporal structures and this of course depends if you have uh, organized the data as we have done in this video by putting all the time the, the snapshot in columns some authors prefer to put them in in rows uh, this one usually uh, is uh, very expensive from a memory point of view but of course this depends on the on the routines that uh, that you are using but uh, in general i would say that when you have very large data sets you should better choose between uh, one of these two and as a last comment uh, note that uh, the amplitudes that we are computing here are uh, mesh dependent estimations of the of the pod amplitudes if we change the number of points the values here will change um, to have a mesh independent estimation of this amplitude you should associate this inner product to, to the continuous domain where the inner product is an integral and uh, uh, this integration uh, can be done using uh, uh, different integration schemes and, and in the case in which we are using just the inner product uh, that is we are using a, a forward integration scheme you should divide uh, you should divide the inner product by the number of points involved in the inner product so in uh, in space domain you should divide by ns and in the time domain you should divide by nt Observe that uh, the modulo uh, software package does this for you and the, all the outputs will be already automatically in, uh, in a normalized and mesh independent form. And finally, as a last step of uh, the last part of this video, I would like to propose some, uh, some exercises. Um, in our GitHub repository, you can find five of these and these are solved both using MATLAB and, uh, and Python. Now in this video I will only discuss uh, two of them. So if I show you our uh, GitHub repository, you will see um, you have two different folders with the solutions of the exercises in MATLAB and in Python, and uh, the data of each exercise is stored in a in another in another different folder. So in each uh, exercise, typically the the files are organized uh, as follows: you have a file A, B, C, D with the function that needs to be called and some info about the, the test cases to be analyzed now notice that these are not designed to be nicely coded uh, so these are not designed for compactness but these are designed to show you all the steps of the decomposition so we favored let's say readability over 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 efficiency of the of the code now among these exercises uh, I will show you only two here in this video observe that these are uh, uh, reflecting our background in fluid mechanics but uh, I hope that you quickly realize that these tools can be used on any area of applied science uh, the, they are also designed to, to span various cases we have a 1D case, you have a scalar test case or a vector field test case uh, here in this video, we'll show you the first case, which is just a 1D example, which is very interesting because it has also analytical solution. And I will show you one test case that comes from uh, time result particle image value symmetry. So uh, it's a, it's a case, test case with real data and so with noise and all the problems that, uh, that this kind of data set have. And finally, as a very last note, uh, please observe that these uh, exercises were designed to severely challenge both the DFT and the POD and hence justify the multi-scale POD that I will describe in the, in the next video. So I encourage you to try both the DFT and the POD on your dataset before uh, you go for more complicated solutions. And so in this exercise, I will now analyze what are the main benefits, advantages of, uh, of each of these two. And uh, hopefully you will understand that uh, there, there would be a good idea to have something in between. And that is what the MPOD uh, will do for you. Now the first exercise is the study of the velocity profile in a 2D channel. 
uh, subject to time dependent pressure gradient uh, oscillation. So this problem is described in a technical note from the von Kármán Institute, which you can download from my ResearchGate page. And here I, I show, I describe two methods to solve the partial differential equation governing the problem, which I write here in dimensionless form. This is a, is a parabolic PDE, which uh, Dirichlet boundary condition on the two sides. And I, I solve the method also using uh, um, eigenfunction expansion. So the eigenfunction of the Laplacian operator in this case, with uh, these two boundary condition, uh, this leads to the cosine basis. And the beauty of this exercise is to construct your eigenfunction expansion and then see how the convergence of the POD significantly outperform the convergence of the eigenfunction expansion. Now, in this particular exercise, we consider the case of a pressure gradient which is composed of two sources, uh, a slow scale, so a low frequency, which is here shown in red, and a fast scale, which is uh, shown here in black, and is a Gaussian modulated frequency uh, that has a much higher frequency content. This is the velocity profile at the center of the, of the, of the channel uh, as a function of time. And you can see that as the highest frequency starts, you have uh, you introduce uh, some additional information on the on the velocity profile. So the question here is, um, can we use the model decomposition to to uh, analyze what is the impact of these two sources on the velocity profile? Can we also use these uh, to localize in time to understand when the uh, second mode, for example, kicks in? And, uh, and study how the velocity how the velocity profile is uh, affected by these two very large uh, frequency lar largely different frequency uh, sources. So um, here I'm showing you the results from the DFT. This is the amplitude of the Fourier modes as a function of their associated frequencies. And this is the same plot, but this time as a function of R. So the index counting from the most important one to the least important one. Now, the first thing we observe is that uh, in, the, in the frequency spectra, we clearly see um, two dominant uh, frequencies. Of course, the spectra is symmetric. Uh, around zero, we have several uh, points that are uh, surely linked to the large scale motion. Uh, at the zero frequency, we have the mean. And at this uh, fast frequencies mirror right here, we have uh, clearly something that is linked to the fast mode. Overall, what we can see is that, of course, since these are uh, these modes comes with conjugate pair, the amplitudes are always uh, coupled, except for the first, which is real, uh, but the others are all complex uh, conjugated pairs. And we can see that the conversion is overall not really good because we need somewhere around 80 modes to before we actually start having modes that have uh, negligible contribution. So if we now move to uh, the study of these modes, here I'm showing you the first three. These are the spatial structures and these are uh, this is a mapping uh, in their frequency domain. So here we have the mode one, which is the, the one corresponding to the mean. So zero frequency, this is a pure uh, real mode. So it is the real part corresponding to the mean. And this is the imaginary part, which is zero in this case. Here you have uh, mode 2 and 3, which are uh, uh, the ones associated to, to the largest frequency besides the, the mean. And uh, these are clearly linked to the large scale uh, perturbation uh, pressure gradient that we have introduced. Observe that, of course, the real part is the same. The imaginary is uh, flipped because these are complex conjugate. And uh, what we can observe is that at this large frequency we are let's say, in a, in a quasi-steady condition. So the velocity profile remains uh, overall parabolic or very close to, to a parabolic shape. On the other hand, if I now uh, look at, uh, at modes corresponding to largest frequency, you can see that the velocity profile tends to, to flatten in the, in the center. Here you have mode 4 and 5, so again, complex conjugate pairs. And here, uh, as an example, I'm showing you mode 8, which is very close to, to mode 5 in the frequency domain and therefore it's also very close uh, to mode 5 in the, in the space domain. So 
what is happening here is that uh, these modes have uh, uh, a temporal structure that is infinite, which is, uh, which is an harmonics that never starts and never finish. However, this specific frequency uh, is localized in time, so it starts at a certain moment and finishes at another moment. And because of this, uh, what, what happens is that the convergence of the Fourier decomposition starts to, to suffer. And you need many temporal structures, many harmonics to represent that temporal evolution. Many harmonics having similar frequencies results in many modes having also similar spatial structures and this is the problem of redundancy and poor convergence of the of the DFT. And so this, this means that uh, when we have uh, phenomena that are localized in time, we will start to need many, many modes representing more or less the same spatial structure. And that is the problem of redundancy, which is of course linked to the problem of poor convergence. So now we move to the case of the POD. Here again, I'm showing you the spectra uh, of, the, of the decomposition, so the amplitudes of the mode, in this case, the POD modes. And I leave here for comparison the amplitudes of the DFT modes. What we can see from the POD is that now, after the, let's say, starting from the third mode, all the amplitudes are almost zero. So it means that uh, the POD has reached convergence in just two modes, with two modes is capable of representing the data that we have introduced. And this is very encouraging because we have introduced two, two modes in the data set. So it is somehow very surprising that then when we look at how these modes look like, we observe these results. So this is the spatial structure of the first mode with the associated temporal structure, and this is the frequency content of these temporal structures. And the same is here with the with the mode 2. What we see is that, uh, well, we do have temporal localization capabilities because we realize that something is, uh, is occurring here, but on the other hand, we cannot really associate uh, this spatial structure to any of the particular frequencies. In fact, in fact, it's a linear combination of them. So what is happening here is that because of the optimality, the POD is choosing uh, uh, a combination of, uh, of the modes that we have introduced. And the result has, has nothing to do with what we have. So here we have uh, a serious problem of, uh, of interpretability, let's say. So this brings now to our observation concerning the POD. Well, we, we got for this particular case that uh, the convergence is extreme. We got only two P2 modes to represent the data, and that was what we were expecting. And what is a, a very remarkable feature is that uh, such an extreme convergence is far, far superior uh, even to the eigenfunction decomposition of the, of the data. Uh, of the of the operator of the Laplacian operator. So I invite you, if you're interested, to to know more about this, to have a look at the at the solution in the technical note about the eigenfunction expansion, and, and you will see that the convergence is uh, is better than the DFT, but uh, by far not comparable to to the POD. On the other hand, uh, here uh, there is a problem of uh, of interpretation. I mean, the modes uh, produced by the POD can represent very well the data set with zero error, but, uh, but they have nothing to do with what we have introduced. We have potentially time localization capabilities because we see that something is changing in time, but we cannot localize these uh, neither in, uh, in the frequency domain nor in the space domain because of this uh, mixing problem. So again, here uh, also for the POD, in case of a non-stationary data set, we can encounter this, uh, this kind of problem. And, and here it is worth uh, remarking that, uh, that the two eigenvalues are, are very different. So the, the, uh, the amplitude associated to, to the PUD modes are very different. If, if, if you consider cases where this amplitude starts to, to be close, let's say it starts to become similar, then you risk to approach uh, uh, the situation in which two eigenvalues are, uh, are repeated. And so in this case, the POD modes are not even unique. So this is uh, become, let's say, increases even more the, the problem of, in, of interpretation. So I close this video with uh, the last exercise, the, the exercise number four, for you to see that you can face similar problems also with experimental data. 
Now in exercise 4 we, uh, we provide the data set of, uh, of uh, time resolved particle image velocimetry measurement of an impinging uh, gas jet. Here um, the, the jet is released with a mean velocity of about 6.5 meter per second through an opening of 4 millimeter and so we have a Reynolds number of about uh, 1700. The measurements are acquired at 2000 Hz and you can find all the details of this experiment in our previous publication that is available on Archive. This test is interesting because uh, although it is in stationary condition we have phenomena occurring at different scales. Here I show you the normalized spectra of the signal at six different locations and the frequency axis is uh, uh, in terms of Struan number that is um, the frequency scaled using the jet opening and, and the outlet velocity. So in the, in the probe P1 uh, next to the jet we observe the roll-like vortices produced by the shear layer instability and these have a, a, a frequency that corresponds to a strong number of about 0 0.3. Then as we move towards the, towards the wall the velocity of the flow decreases and so also the, the frequency content in the signal uh, decreases. And then finally let's say here far from the impact in the wall jet region we have uh, a very large uh, scale uh, motion, so very low frequency content. Here I show you some uh, exemplary POD modes. Uh, I show you here the spatial structures and here below is the frequency content of, the, of their associated temporal structures. And you can see that these spectra are, are quite broad. So for example, this mode is mostly linked to, to the large vortices evolving uh, downstream the jet but uh, it has also some, both some large, uh, low frequency content and high frequency content. This mode is mostly associated to what is happening in the, in the wall jet, so you have very low frequency, but there's also some higher frequency content, and uh, as a result, you, you, have, uh, you see some vertical structures also in the jet. And here we have a very much higher frequency content linked to the, to the Kelvin elements instability the vortex is produced here next to the jet, but the, the, the spectra is really broad. Now, um, we should discuss this exercise more in detail in the, in the next video, but um, for the moment I would say that uh, I thank you for your attention and I hope to see you in the next video that will be fully dedicated to the multi-scale proper orthogonal decomposition. So, See you in the next video.